Hi, I'm Jenny from American Hydroponics and welcome to our monthly webinar. Every month we provide um, webinars just of, of some different tips, tricks and, and things that we've learned in our 35 uh, years of hydroponic growing. So this month, being as we're in the middle of winter, what we're going to talk about is how to prepare your, not your greenhouse necessarily, but your entire hydroponic business for winter. One of the great things about um, hydroponic growing is that you can supply year-round your customers with product, whereas uh, maybe in our area, we're here in Northern California, and we have really great growers here, um, and they can provide beautiful basil in the summer months and some nice lettuce in the summer months, but like anywhere, when it comes to the winter months, it makes it a little more difficult to grow. As a hydroponic grower, you can actually grow year-round, and we're going to give you some tips. There's a couple of things that you need to be aware of um, to, to be able to grow consistently and to provide your customers with year-round consistent produce. So um, let me, I'm just going to kind of lay out for you some of the things we're going to talk about in, in this webinar, and one of them is um, maintenance. What kind of maintenance do you need to do? for your greenhouse going into the winter months. We're gonna talk about seeding schedule. That'll be one of the most critical and important things you do to be able to provide year round growing of a consistent and top quality to your customers. Supplemental lighting and environmental controls, what you'll need to do when you have a commercial greenhouse like this. There are some things that you're gonna to need to change around uh, in your environmental controls and, and your supplemental lighting. Um, you may need to change varieties, and we'll give some examples of what kind of varieties work well in a long day and a short day. And then um, insect and disease potentials, what can happen in, in different times of the year. So um, for year-round growing, as you can see, we're here in our greenhouse. We've got beautiful, we're in the middle of, Dece of the middle of January, and we've got beautiful green produce growing up behind us. Um, and what, what do you need to do to get, keep this kind of growing, going year round to supply your, grow, to supply your um, customers and keep revenue coming in and keeping your bis business afloat? Um, one of the first things you need to do really very consistently is you need to have a log. And in that log, you need to be tracking like, um, you know, when does it start to get really cold? When do you start to notice the light? And yeah, you can get all these things through either the Farmer's Almanac or just looking at weather. But if you're keeping them for your specific region, then you can really zero in and, and notice what happens in your re region. When does the first frost come? But even more importantly, what varieties grow well? As many of you know, if you've watched any of our, our videos or if you know us, we're in far northern California. We're about an hour and a half south of the Oregon border. So we're pretty far... Um, far up the coast and that's that's another thing we're right on the coast so we have mountains we have ocean and, and we're pretty far north we're at about 41 our, our latitude is about 41 here in Humboldt County where we're located so some varieties might grow really well for us that may not grow so well for someone who's down in Central California so you can't even just say California right um, and that is I mean, just exponentially, when you look at around the world, we've got customers all around the world in 66 countries. So there's no way for you to say this is going to be the perfect variety for you to grow in your business. Um, we always kind of look at what area you're in, what your daylight looks like, your hours are, that sort of thing. So with this in mind, you need to keep a really good log of what kind of varieties work really well for you. And maybe you try something new and you find out it does fantastic. Um, you know, you want to keep lo a log of that. Or maybe you try something and it doesn't do well. Or maybe it does well in the summer and not in the low light winter months. Those kind of things you need to keep track on. The other thing you might want to keep track of is how much nutrient you use. You'll, nu you'll use more nutrient um, in the summertime than you will in the wintertime. So you might want to keep track of how much nutrient you, you use so you can order ahead. So keeping really good logs of what your business is in your exact region will help you a lot, especially as you go on down the road and you have a couple of years behind you. You can kind of look back and say, oh yeah, I remember this is when it really starts getting cold here. Um, so that log will really be your number one thing. Um, when we talk about going into winter growing, what we're talking about is right about that autumn equinox, right about sometimes towards the end of, December, uh, end of September, 
um, your, your light is going to start decreasing. It might start getting a little cool. And again, remembering that the further you away from the equator you are in either direction, the greater the variance that you're going to see in your particular location. So again, we're pretty, pretty far north here in, in California. So we do see a lot of difference. Right now, for example, we get about nine and a half hours of light a day. During the summertime, we can get over 14 hours of light a day. So you can see the variance there. You'll need to know those things in your location and wherever you are. Um, so we, let's see, let's talk about maintenance. Um, first and foremost, super, super common sense things to do. So again, let that equinox kind of be your, um, your alarm clock throughout the year to tell you, hey, it's time to start taking a look at things. You're going into the winter months. So for maintenance, you want to do things like you want to walk around um, your greenhouse. First of all, you want to walk around the outside of your greenhouse. You want to take a look and you want to see, are any weeds growing up against your greenhouse? You want to get rid of those as, as soon as possible. Um, you want to clean out your gutters on your greenhouse. If not, the water could back up and it could force, you know, water's pretty aggressive, so it could force some leaks coming in. Um, you want to look for leaks. You want to make sure there's no rips and tears in your shade screen or if you have poly on your um, sidewalls. Your insect, that's super critical. Your insect screen on your vents, you want to make sure that you don't have any kind of um, rips or tears or anything like that. Now is the time to really start doing, taking care of all of those maintenance things. As you start going into the winter months, you're going to have shorter days, uh, maybe harsher weather, depending on your climate and where you are. So you really want to take care of all of those kind of maintenance. Um, Check your propane levels if you use propane. Um, check your tank house. Make sure that your tank house is, is running optimally. Make sure that your doser is good. You might want to just do a manual check on your environmental controls. Kind of do your, your manual open and close and everything and make sure your vents are opening completely and closing completely and, and your roof vent is opening and closing. Make sure your um, screen or your shade screen is, is closing all the way and opening all the way. You just want to perform all of those kind of manual tests so you can make sure that everything is operating fully because it would be a bummer if you're in a harsh climate and it's snowing outside and you find out you have a leak in your greenhouse. You got to get the thing fixed right away. So do it. Let this uh, autumn equinox kind of be this end of September time, kind of be your, your alarm clock to say, okay, let's kind of just go into a, a check, a maintenance check. Um, then there's the seeding schedule. So this is the trickiest one for people. You want to be sure that you are supplying your um, customers consistently year-round. That's one of the huge benefits about hydroponics and about growing in a controlled environment like this is that you can grow year-round your vegetables year-round. So what you're going to need to do is you're going to have to pay attention to your seeding schedule. And what that means is maybe you seed on, um, in a greenhouse like this, this is our uh, Get Growing 10K. It's about 2,800 square feet, not including the vine crop side, just the leafy green side here. And we seed twice a day, uh, I'm sorry, twice a week on something like this. So we seed part of the greenhouse um, on Tuesdays, part of the greenhouse on Fridays. Um, what you're going to need as you're going into your winter months, you're going to need to start seeding more frequently so that you can still have that same amount of produce because your produce will slow down. The growth of your produce will slow down. And if you just continue seeding once every seven days on Tuesdays and on Fridays, your produce will take a little longer to get to a harvestable or marketable weight. And so your, your growth will slow down and you won't be able to serve your customers as well. So. Let me see if I can kind of walk you through a little better what that's going to mean. Is, for example, um, starting at the end of September, you're, you might want to start seeding, let's, again, let's just use the example that you seed every seven days, once a week, and that gives you lettuce crops like um, you see here and basil like you see here, um, is a 42-day crop. So generally, that's exactly six weeks. You seed on a Tuesday. Six weeks later, you can harvest on a Tuesday. That's, that's the ideal. Well, when you're going into the winter months like this, what's going to happen is that's going to slow down. So instead of seeding every Tuesday, you're going to need to, to shorten up your seeding cycle so that maybe you're going to seed every, um, in September, at the end of September, say going into October, you might seed every five to six days or even every four to five days. 
instead of every seven days. And that's going to ensure that you don't have a gap in your production for your customers. So you want to shrink this down from the months of, sep um, like I said, from the end of September, October, and all the way through November, you want to be sure that you're seeding every four to five days um, to make sure that you don't have any gaps in your production. Then in December, you can go back to about uh, December and January, you can go back to about every seven days, something like that. And then in January, you want to stretch it out a little bit because everything, it's going to start getting lighter again. It's going to start starting to get a little bit warmer. So you'll want to see it about every seven or eight days there or else you're going to get a backup in your system and you're going to have plants, you know, kind of overflowing each other. So um, September, October, November, like I said, right around the end of September, every four to five days. December, you can go back to your every seven days. And then January and February, you want to do something like every seven to eight days, something like that. And then all the way from April, all the way through October, um, August, every seven days should be fine to keep that consistent harvest going. It's just that uh, the, the time between that, right after the autumn equinox, all the way up to the end of November that you want to seed more often. So that's, that's seeding. Um, Another thing that you want to be aware of when you're going into the winter months is your environmental controls, and which includes your lighting, which will be a big part of it. And as you'll notice on your screen, there's a chart on there. And this is one, it's accessible all over. I just pulled this off the internet. And what it shows you is every month, how many moles are collected in even all the regions. It's of the US. The, the map I have here is of the US. But that's a great one to be able to kind of take a look at, see where you are in the US, and then be able to see what kind of light moles are there. Now, just a little word of caution, yeah, I do say that you need about 17 to 19 moles of light um, for optimal growing, but what that is, is that's sunlight. And so the chart that you're looking at is actual outdoor sunlight. Most greenhouses have a, um, trans a light transmission rate of, let's say, you know, 70 or 80 percent. So that means you're, le you're losing 20 to 30 percent of those moles. So when you're kind of looking at that chart and you're calculating and you're saying, ah, you know, I'm fitting right in there, you have to remember that when you're growing in a greenhouse with the greenhouse covering, depending on the age of the greenhouse, what kind it is, whether it's glass or polycarbonate or poly, you have to remember that, um, you know, there, 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 there will be some loss um, as the light is coming through there. And generally, depending on what your light transmission is, you're gonna lose 20 to 30%. So if you're looking at the region, if you're looking at that map, and you see on there, oh, you know, in January, you might have a light trans re transmission, or a, I'm sorry, in January, you're looking at that map and you see that you have moles of, you know, maybe 20, you might think that's great. But then remembering as it comes through your greenhouse, you're losing some of some of the that light through the transmission so you'll want to be able to take a 30 percent discount on that and say oh well okay then i'm really only getting 14 coming in through here so you'll want to adjust your supplemental lighting based on that so again that chart is something that you can get on the internet anytime um, pull it off for your region take a look at it and it goes month by month to show you what the average lighting is Per month. Plants need anywhere from about 14 to 16 hours of light um, as, as their optimal growth conditions. So um, we're a little bit short on that. So what we do here is we switch our, our lights. We add our supplemental lights for a couple of hours in the morning and a couple of hours in the evening. Uh, starting about in October. So you'll notice in October and November that might work, but December and January, you might need to change it around a little bit. So you have to kind of take a look at it again in December and say, well, do I need to add them for a little bit longer time? Or are they, you know, maybe there's a gap in September, you had your lights coming on at six o'clock at night. Well, maybe you need to, in December, switch it to the, so they come on around 4.30 or 5 o'clock. So you'll need to kind of take a look at that. Always be aware of your environmental controls and your lighting. Um, so plants need what's called moles, um, and that's how you measure sunlight. And ideally, plants need somewhere between about 17 and 19 moles per square meter is how they measure them um, every day to grow. And one, you know, you, you can get light sensors out there if you have a pretty um, advanced environmental control, something like the Autogrow Multi, um, you can do a, a Wadsworth even, even the Privas and the Argus, they all 
allow you to get light sensors and you'll want to put your light sensor in there. It'll collect the moles every day and it will automatically turn on lights if you haven't re reached whatever that set point is. And like I said, 17 to 19 moles a day are what plants like. If you don't have that kind of a system, um, probably the best way to do it, just a, a quick calculation. Again, your plants need about 14 to 16 hours of light. So you know if you have nine and a half hours, you need to add about five and a half or six and a half hours of light during the um, evening or morning and evening hours for them to get that optimal light. So if you just want an easy conversion and you look at that 17 to 19 moles, that 14 to 16 hours a day is it. Now, I just want to make a disclaimer. Pretty much everything I'm talking about here has to do with leafy greens. When you're talking about fruiting crops, that's really different. They need a lot more light for something like that. Fruiting crops might need as much as 30 to 35 moles a day. So um, you'll have to have a different lighting spectrum over your fruiting crops. But for leafy greens, which is pretty much what we're talking about in this webinar, you need um, 14 to 16 hours a day and that kind of um, 17 to 19 moles a day. Um, environmental controls. So let's talk about that a little bit. You'll need to make sure that your heater is working, part of that maintenance, right? You'll need to make sure that your heater and your CO2 is coming on. In this greenhouse, we have hydronic heating and our cement floor. So you'll want to make sure, get those things all fired up. Um, as it starts to get cooler and cooler, again, from that September, October, November, as it starts to get cooler, you may want to a couple of times during that period set your environmental controls so that maybe the, the heat temperature comes on. Um, you know, I think right now we have three different uh, settings on our temperature, right? We have middle of the night setting or early morning setting, I think like wait, three o'clock in the morning. Then we have a nine o'clock in the morning setting and then we have an afternoon setting. So if it gets super cold, that it's gonna kick on at any of those times to the set points that we've set it at. Um, you always wanna check your humidity um, where we are here in Northern California, we have a really bad problem with humidity. Um, we have a lot of cloud cover. So that can cause, you know, really, really cold nights, warm days, and then kind of get cold in the middle of the day, which is a, a big problem for powdery mildew for us. So you'll want to check what your humidity is, and you'll want to be sure, again, kind of looking back at, at historically what it's looked like in your area, you'll want to be sure to adjust your environmental controls for that. Um, another thing that you'll want to be careful of is the vents, and you maybe have kind of heard them maybe opening and closing while we've been talking here, but you want to be really careful if you're in a very, very cold climate that your vents don't open too quickly um, or that they don't open too far because if your greenhouse is at a nice, toasty, perfect 70 degrees and then maybe it gets a little bit high and so the environmental sensor says, okay, it's time to get a little bit of, of air in here and they open up the vents either too far, too fast, or too long, cold air is gonna come flooding in and it's gonna change dramatically or, or too rapidly the air inside your greenhouse. So you'll wanna check that, make sure that your vents aren't opening too far or too fast or staying open too long, that's, that's something. Um, another thing in your environmental controls with your dosing and your nutrients, you wanna be really careful that you um, check your EC. pH should remain pretty stable throughout the year, that's not a problem, but in the summertime, your plants are taking up lots and lots and lots because it's naturally warmer, there's more light, so your plants are transpiring, therefore they're taking up a lot more nutrient, um, so you're gonna go through your nutrient a lot quicker, but you're also, your plants are getting a lot more nutrient. Well, when their growth slows down like it does in the winter time, they won't be taking up as much nutrient. So one way to um, accommodate for that is to up your nutrient, up the EC on your nutrient. For example, lettuce normally you might run at something like a 1.2 um, EC, something like that. You might want to up it to a 1.4 or 1.6 during the winter time. Same with basil, as you see here. Um, normally, basil can take it a little bit, can, can take a little more nutrients. So maybe you run basil normally at 1.4. You might want to up it to a 2.0 or even a, a 2.2 so it can get all that nutrient to grow to its optimal um, conditions for the basil. So you'll want to check your EC and up your EC in the, in the winter time. Um, all right, so then the, one of, the next thing is you're changing varieties. 
you may need to look at the varieties. There are things, and particularly in lettuce, which we, we grow a lot of, a lot of our growers do. Um, there's a long day variety, which is exactly what it sounds like. When the day is long, it grows really well, um, maybe slow to bolt, and, and that would be in the summertime. There's a long day variety. One of the most popular is a butter lettuce like Rex or Charles. Those are butter lettuces. They're probably the most commercially um, grown butter lettuces. Those are long day varieties. Um, and maybe in the wintertime you want to switch to something like a, a short day variety. And I think it's a Fidel is a short day variety. You won't necessarily, your customers won't necessarily notice the difference because they look very, very similar. But they've been bred to be, one has been bred for optimal growing conditions in, in long sunlight and one's been bred for optimal conditions in, in shorter sunlight in winter times. So you may need to change that. Maybe you don't have as big a market. Maybe people aren't eating as much lettuce in the wintertime. So you need to switch to something like maybe kale or chard or, or culinary herbs or something like that that'll be have a higher market value or more market value for you. So check out the varieties. Uh, the other piece of that is you always want to be checking out varieties. We use Johnny seeds, we use Paramount seeds. Paramount's great. Um, both of these are non-GMO seeds. You can get them organic if, if you're growing organic. But these are great because they have a lot of information on them. You can see there are always new varieties that are coming out that might say, uh, you know, downy mildew resistant or slow bolting lettuce or something or long day variety or short day variety. So you always want to be checking to see what kind of new varieties are out there. Also, there are some that are um, less prone to pests. So you want to take a look at that. So you always want to look when you're going into wintertime at your, the varieties. And again, by keeping that log, trying out new varieties, maybe you tried out a, a Rex and grew it all last summer or grew it all last year, the entire year, and found out it really didn't do that well in, in summer, in wintertime. Well, that, that's because it's, it's not really bred to grow in those short days. So you look up and you see, well, maybe you tried a, a Fidel butter, butter leaf and you found out that that really did grow really well. So you want to keep, make sure you keep that, all of that information in your logs. And again, keep checking those, um, all your seed companies because they always are coming out with new varieties, especially with the explosion in popularity with hydroponics. Seed companies are now focusing on seeds and plants that are specifically bred for hydroponic growing. So you'll want to keep your eye out for something like that. Um, and last is disease and insect um, potential. What kind of diseases and insects can you um, anticipate uh, coming into winter? Well, one, I mean, actually it's a little bit of the opposite, but if you think about cold weather means less pests, which means it's a great time for maintenance. Again, kind of going through and checking all of your insect screens and you might need to take a look at your IPM program, that integrated pest management. Maybe you don't need to order all of those same pests as often and do them on the, on the same schedule you've been doing them because coming into winter time, you're, you're gonna have less pests um, in your greenhouse, ideally. Um, another thing is disease. You've heard me mention a lot in a lot of our different podcasts about our issues with powdery mildew in this particular area. So as soon as you see anything, as soon as you see the littlest bit of powdery mildew, as soon as you see the first white fly growing on your tomatoes, take care of it. Um, get it taken care of. It's a li little easier to take care of. We always, when we do things, we always use Omri listed, which are organic and, and natural um, sources. So if we do have to spray something, we always use an organic listed, an Omri listed product. Um, and so you want to do that as soon as you see something, because again, you don't want it to perpetuate and get much worse, like powdery mildew is horrible, right? Powdery mildew, the spores are just living in the air. And, and in months like this, when it kind of gets really warm during the day and cold at night or cloud cover comes, um, they can really get, powdery mildew can really get bad just with the spores living in the air. So as soon as you start to see it on some of your, um, some of your leaves, fortunately we don't have any here, but as soon as you start to see it, you really want to get on it with something like a, a mixture of seeds and millstop or something like that. So um, one way to understand what kind of pe pests, and, and hopefully these people can become good friends of yours, um, you want to go to your local ag extension. Um, tell them you're a local farmer, what you're growing, and ask them what kind of pests are super common to your area and how do you fight them. Um, your ag extension is super helpful and every region has one in the U.S. So you'll want to do that. Um, 
And again, be vigilant with um, dealing with disease and insect. That's the best way to gain control of it because you don't want to have to shut down. And we have more customers than I can tell you that let something get out of the way. So they have to shut down their entire greenhouse because it gets so bad, clean out the whole thing, and then restart it again. So once you see something, take care of it right away. Um, switch up your varieties. Um, find disease. Uh, disease resistant varieties. So switch up your varieties a little bit. And maybe you're growing a breen lettuce or something like that, a breen bromaine. It's a small red um, romaine. Maybe you're growing something like that. Switch it up to maybe a, a different kind of romaine. So by switching up your varieties too, then you're not gonna, you're not gonna leave the, the pests growing and kind of hiding in that one variety too much. So, um, so that was kind of everything. Just, I know it's a lot of information, but you do it once or twice a year. You take care of your greenhouse that way. You anticipate what's happening in your greenhouse because this is your business. This is your livelihood. So you anticipate what's happening so that you can grow year round and you can satisfy your customers' needs year round. That's what our goal is, is to help you become a successful hydroponic grower. So um, thanks for watching. We have a couple of specials. Uh, we have the deal of the month. As you know, we always try at the end of the uh, webinars, we always try and add a special deal for people who've watched it. Um, and this one is our hydroponic seminar is coming up. We still have a few spots left. It's coming up on February 21st and 22nd. Um, it's normally $995 and you can bring one or two people um, for that price. Now it's going to be $595 for the same deal um, and with this deal, and you'll, you'll see it come up on your screen, with this deal, um, you also get two nights in a hotel with this. So it's a really great deal. It's hands-on experience here in this greenhouse. You'll actually be seeding, transplanting, harvesting, packaging. You'll be doing all of that sort of stuff. So um, that's, a, that's a great deal. And our next webinar, so next month in February, we won't have one because we'll actually be having the seminar here. But then in March, our next um, webinar is coming up and it's the NFT systems for hydroponic farming. And there's a couple of different types. So join us for that, sign up for that, and we hope to see you then. Thanks.